The interpolating expressions are really useful tools that can help you automate and save a ton of time and effort in After Effects. And they're just all around really versatile expressions to know about. The basic concept of what they do is they let you convert a range of values to a different range of values. Let me give you an example. Say I want the red circle to grow as it gets closer to the white circle. With an interpolating expression, I tell it when the distance between these two circles is zero, I want the red circle scale to be 200. And when the distance between them is 1000 pixels or bigger, I want the red circle scale to be 100. With those two ranges plugged in and the distance between the circles as the input, the expression does all the work for us when it comes to setting the scale of the red circle, without us even having to make a single keyframe. Now that was just one example to try to get the concept across, but what you can do with it is practically endless, and it's an amazing tool to just know about and have in your back pocket. The interpolating expressions take five values. The first is going to be your input, so for our circle example, it would have been the distance between the circles. The next two are the minimum and maximum value of your input range. So again, from our example, the minimum distance was 0 and the maximum distance was 1000. Now the last two values are what the input min and max are going to be converted or interpolated to, which from our example was 200 and 100. So you might be wondering why it's arranged the way it is, because your first instinct might be to say, well, when it's 1000 pixels away, I want the scale to be 100, and when it's 0 pixels away, I want the scale to be 200. But the reason I arranged it how I did is because the input values are a minimum and maximum. So to read this out in English, we're actually saying, when the distance is less than or equal to 0, I want the scale to be 200. And when the distance is greater than or equal to 1000, I want the scale to be 100. Now everything in between our minimum and maximum input range gets interpolated based on which interpolation expression we use, and there's four of them. They're pretty self-explanatory once you see the names, but I'll just go over them real quick. Linear just interpolates linearly, like regular keyframes. There's also ease, which is just like eased keyframes, so the interpolation starts and ends smoothly. And the last two are ease in and ease out, which, as you can probably figure out, ease as it starts but not as it ends, or the opposite. Now that we've gone over how the expression works, let's actually get to some practical examples so you can get an idea of how and why this is so useful. To start off, the way I use these types of expressions the most is to do what I call variable parenting. I mean, that's kind of a lie. I don't really call it that. I just do it. It's, you know, who names things that they do. It's kind of weird, right? Basically, what variable parenting trademark is used for is a way to parent or pick whip a value to something and choose the level of influence you want that relationship to have. So for example, if I pick whip the position of this green circle to the white one, we know the green circle is going to copy the white circle's position exactly and stick right to it. But what if I wanted the green circle's position to only be 50% influenced by the white circle's position? Or what if I wanted to parent the green circle to the white circle but have that transition be animated smoothly instead of just a snap-on parenting? Both of those are actually really easy to do. First, you need to add a slider to the green circle by going to Effect, Expression Control, Slider. Then you'll need to add an interpolating expression to its position. So hitting P to open up the position, I'll hold Alt or Option on a Mac and click the stopwatch to open up the expression box. Next, I'll write Ease, and as the input, I'll pick whip the slider value. After that, as the input min and max, I'll write 0 and 100 so that we can control this by moving or animating the slider between those values. So when the slider's at zero or less, I want the green circle's position to be its own position. So we'll type in value, meaning whatever our position value is actually set to. And then when the slider is at 100 or more, I want the green circle's position to be the white circle's position. So we'll just pick whip over to the white circle's position, close the brackets, and that's it. Now if I wanted the green circle's position to be 50% influenced by the white circles, I could just set the slider value to 50 and here we've got it. Or if I wanted to transition the green circle to smoothly be influenced by the white one, all I have to do is animate the slider from 0 to 100. Now building off of what we just did with the circles, I can show you an actual example of when I use variable parenting trademark, which is for doing stabilizing zooms on faces or objects. If you watch a lot of YouTube, you might recognize this sort of face stabilization as a popular edit that people do. For the most part, people usually just cut straight to the zoomed in and stabilized edit, but we can actually step it up a little bit and get fancy by using variable parenting trademark to add in a smooth transition into that stabilized edit for extra style points. The stabilization itself is just done by motion tracking whatever you want to stabilize to, applying it to a null, and then variable parenting the original anchor point of your footage to the position of the null. Then you just have to keyframe the scale to zoom in at the same time. Now just as an aside, I want to draw attention to the fact that there is a stabilized motion option for the motion tracker, but I've never actually seen a point in using that because what it does is it just takes the point you've tracked and applies the point's position to your footage's anchor point. So it's exactly what we've done with our null, except the null is a lot more flexible and it's a non-destructive way to achieve the same thing. Anyways, variable parenting trademark is really useful for a ton of things, so I'm sure you can find plenty of situations down the road where it'll come in handy. One more example for how you can use these interpolating expressions is to help yourself make some templates. 
Let's say I'm working on a project that's got a starry theme to it, and I want to make some assets that I can reuse for it. So as a demo, I'm going to make a star wipe transition type thing. To start, I'll create a new null, and with it selected, I'll hit enter and rename it to controller. Then I'll add a slider to it and rename it to transition percent. Next, with the star selected, I'll hold control or command on a Mac and double click this icon right here to center the anchor point. Making sure that the transition percent slider is exposed on our null, I'm going to hit P on the star to bring up its position. Then holding Alt or Option on a Mac, I'll click on the stopwatch to open the expression box. To help keep this organized, we'll create a variable for our slider and just call it slider. Then I'll add an equal sign and pick whip over to our transition percent slider's value and add a semicolon to end the line. On the next line, I'll create another variable, which will be our new x position. So we'll just name it x, hit equals again, and then type linear. Now as our input, we can just write slider because we have that set up as a variable. And as the input min and max, we'll write 0 and 100. Now for the first output variable, when the slider is at 0, I want the position to be outside of frame on the left. So we'll just type negative 150 to make it start 150 pixels left of the frame. Then when the slider is at 100, I want the x position to be 150 pixels to the right of the frame. To do that, instead of just entering in the composition width plus 150, we can actually make this work universally by writing this comp dot width plus 150. So now this output variable will always be the composition's width plus 150, so no matter what the composition size is, it'll always work. Don't forget to end the line with a semicolon, and then as the last line, we'll just set the position. So I'll open square brackets to set the x and y value, and for the x value, we'll just write x since that's the variable we made, and for the y value, we'll just set it to the actual y value. Now if I just drag the slider back and forth, we can see that the star is moving across the screen from 150 pixels outside of frame left to 150 pixels outside of frame right. Next, we'll add in some rotation to make it a little less boring. So with the star selected and holding shift, I'm going to hit R as well to open up the rotation and also keep the position open. Then we'll just open up the rotation's expression box and here I'll write linear and then pick whip the X value of our position as the input. The input range is going to be from 150 pixels left of frame to 150 pixels right of frame. So we're just going to type in negative 150 and then as the max, we're going to type in this comp dot width plus 150. And then finally, as the output values, we're going to have 0 and 360, so that the star does one full rotation as it moves across the screen. Next, I'll duplicate the star with Control or Command D, and we're going to change the position expression slightly on this one. But first, let's go to our controller null and duplicate our slider and rename it to Offset. Now back to the new star, we'll open up its expression box for position and delete the x variable. Also, in here we can change the slider variable to reference the offset slider we just made by typing in what we named it over here. Alright, so instead of having this star follow the slider as well, I think it'll look a lot cooler if we have it copy the previous star and add a slight delay. So for the new x variable, I'll write this comp.layer and then in brackets index plus 1, which tells After Effects that I want to reference the layer whose index is the same as this one plus 1, which would be the one below it in the layer stack as you can see over here. Next, to reference that layer's position, I'll just write dot transform dot position on the end. And now we can add a delay to it by writing dot value at time and then in brackets time minus slider. What this line now does is it gets the position of the layer below this one and tells us what the position was at time minus slider, which means right now minus whatever we have our offset slider set to in seconds. The last thing we need to do is just make sure we're only getting the x value of the position and then just finish off the line with a semicolon. So now we'll just animate the transition percent value to complete over about a second and then change the offset to something like 0.5. And now we can see that the second star is delayed by half a second. And now we'll just arrange the y position of the stars a little more nicely and duplicate the newest one, move it down, and continue doing that till we've got a full column of stars. And now you can see why we wrote the second star's expression the way we did. Since we didn't write in a hard reference to a specific layer, but it's just referencing the layer below it, all of our position expressions just chain together perfectly without having to change anything. And I'll stop with our transition example right there, but of course you can always add more things to it to make it look cooler, like adding an echo effect to each star layer, and then creating more sliders on our null and having that control its properties, or just adding some glows and just other stuff to make it look cooler. But that's all up to you, and it's kind of far away from the point of the demo, which was showing you how useful interpolating expressions can be. If you found this helpful and want to learn more about expressions, I did a whole other video on the wiggle expression that you should check out. And I mean, even if you already know all about the wiggle expression, you should still check it out because there's probably some stuff in there that you didn't know. And as I was saying that just now, I realized that sounded pretty cocky, but in my defense, all I want is more views.